of the great trio of high renaissance artists Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael who is considered the master? Most historians and critics agree that it was Raphael Sanzio. 1483-1520, who most clearly stated the ideals of the High Renaissance. Though arch-rivals Leonardo da Vinci, 1452-1519, and Michelangelo. Bonarotti, 1475-1564, influenced the younger Raphael, he developed his own style. A prolific painter, he was also a great technician whose work is characterized by a seemingly effortless grace. His most well-known work is the School of Athens, 1509-11. Which has been called a complete statement of the High Renaissance in its artistic form and spiritual meaning. The painting, which projects a stage like space onto a two dimensional surface, reconvenes the great minds of the ancient world Plato, Aristotle, Pythagoras, Heraclitus, Diogenes, Euclid for an exchange of ideas. Raphael even included himself in this gathering of greatness. But it seems only appropriate for the master to be in such company, in this work. Raphael has achieved the art of perspective. Bringing the discipline of mathematics to pictorial space where human figures appear to move naturally. Did Michelangelo study anatomy? Yes, in 1492 Michelangelo Bonarotti, 1475-1564, a master sculptor of the human form, undertook the study of anatomy based on the dissection of corpses from the hospital of Santo Spirito. Perhaps most well known for his sculptures of David, 1501-04, and Moses, 1515-15. As well as his frescoes on the ceiling and walls of the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo was also an architect who believed that buildings should follow the form of the human body to the extent of disposing units. Symmetrically around a central and unique axis, in a relationship like that of the arms to the body. He also wrote poetry, he was a true Renaissance man. Michelangelo was totally absorbed in his work and was known to be impatient with himself and with others. He has been likened to German composer Ludwig van Beethoven. 1770 to 1827, since the personal letters of both men reveal a deep sympathy and concern for those close to them. And profound understanding of humanity informs their works, Gardner's Art Through the Ages. Why were Matisse's paintings considered so shocking when they were debuted? Even if they seem commonplace to art today, the color and style of the paintings. Of French Expressionist Henri Matisse, 1869-1954, were revolutionary in their day. In 1905 Matisse, along with several other artists, exhibited works at Paris's Salon d'Automne. The wildly colorful paintings on display there are said to have 
prompted an art critic to exclaim that they were fov, or wild beasts. The name stuck, Matisse and his contemporaries who were using brilliant colors in an arbitrary fashion became known as the fov. His famous work Madame Matisse, or Green Stripe, 1905, showed his wife with blue hair and a green stripe. Running down the middle of her face, which was colored pink on one side of her nose and yellow on the other. Matisse was at the forefront of a movement that was building new artistic values. The Fauve were not using color in a scientific manner, as George Seurat had done. Nor were they using it in the nondescriptive manner of Paul Gauguin, 1848-1903, and Vincent van Gogh, 1853-1890. The Fauve were developing the concept of abstraction. Throughout his career, Matisse continued to experiment with various art forms painting, paper cutouts, and sculptures. All of his works indicate a progressive elimination of detail and simplification of line and color. So influential was his style on modern art that some 70 years later one art critic commented that it was as if Matisse belonged to a later generation and a different world. What was the Chautauqua movement? It was a cultural, religious and political education movement that began in the 1870s and lasted into the 1920s. An estimated 45 million Americans participated in the Chautauqua, making it a dominant force in American life during its day. Theodore Roosevelt, 1858-1919, hailed it as the most American thing in America, and, during World War I. 1914 to 18, Woodrow Wilson, 1856 to 1924, claimed that it was an integral part of the national defense. Some scholars credit the Chautauqua movement with sowing the seeds of liberal thought in America. The movement began in 1874 at a Methodist Episcopal campsite on the shores of Lake Chautauqua. New York. There a young minister named John H. Vincent, 1932-1920, of Camden, New Jersey. Endeavored to train Sunday school teachers in a summer camp atmosphere. The program grew in popularity and was expanded beyond Bible study and religious training to include lessons in literacy, history, and sociology. Chautauqua-style summer camps, commonly called Sunday school assemblies, began popping up across the nation, all of them featured a general meeting hall or pavilion set in a campground. By 1900 there were 200 pavilions in 31 states. Attendees of all ages would attend the summer programs, which featured speakers on a wide variety of subjects, including the arts, travel, and politics. Performances also became part of the movement, with a variety of musicians and entertainers joining the lecturers. Early in the 20th century the Chautauqua became increasingly secular and went on the road as an organized lecture and entertainment circuit. Speakers and performers traveled from town to town, where tents were set up for weeks at a 
time to house the summer programs. Many Americans saw their first movies in Chautauqua tents. The movement died out in the mid-1920s, with the improvement of communications and transportations. Some consider the Chautauqua the first form of American mass culture. The Chautauqua Institute in New York continues to host a summer education program in the spirit of the original. Why is the Globe Theatre famous? The Globe is known because of William Shakespeare's 1564 to 1616 involvement in it. In the 1590s an outbreak of the plague prompted authorities to close London theatres. At the time Shakespeare was a member of the Lord Chamberlain's Men, an acting company. With other members of the troupe, he helped finance the building of the Globe. On the banks of the Thames River, which opened in 1599 as a summer playhouse. Plays at the Globe, then outside of London proper, drew good crowds. And the Lord Chamberlain's men also gave numerous command performances at court for King James. By the turn of the century, Shakespeare was considered London's most popular playwright. And by 1603 the acting group, whose summer home was the Globe Theatre, was known as the King's Men. Which Van Eyck Hubert or Jen painted the Ghent altarpiece? The large, multi-paneled altarpiece is as controversial as it is admired. The controversy stems from an 1832 discovery, under a coat of paint on one of its outside panels of a Latin poem that indicated that Hubert, 1395-1441, had begun the work and Jan. c. 1370-1426, had completed it. So it was believed that the Ghent altarpiece, 1432, was a collaboration between the Flemish brothers. But the question of attribution continued to puzzle art historians for a century and a half as attempts to assign different parts of the polyptych. Multi-paneled work, to either of the brothers failed to gain acceptance. One art historian suggested that Hubert may not have been a painter at all, but rather a sculptor. This theory posited that Hubert's contribution was only in crafting the frames from which the paintings had been removed in 1566 and which were subsequently lost. However, scholars seem to have now reached the consensus that Hubert was largely responsible for the design of the altarpiece and for much of its execution. While Jan was the designer and painter of most of the figures. This elaborate altarpiece, which is composed of 20 folding panels, was typical of Northern European art during the Middle Ages, 500-1350. However, both Van Eyck's contributed to the flowering of Renaissance art in Northern Europe as well. In Jan's works, which are finely detailed and ornamental, he was originally a miniaturist and illuminator, the progression from medieval to Renaissance art can be seen. In particular, his painting Man in a Red Turban, 1433, 
which may be a self-portrait, marks an important step in the humanization of art. Prior to this, the artist's subjects had been religious in nature. Here the painting is simply a record of a living individual. This kind of portraiture began to multiply as artists and patrons. Alike became increasingly interested in the reality revealed by them. Through such portraits, man began to confront himself rather than the otherworldly anonymity of the Middle Ages. Renaissance art in Italy as well as in Northern Europe marks the climax of the slow but mighty process. That brings man's eyes down from the supernatural to the natural world, Gardner's art through the ages. Was Beethoven really deaf for much of his life? Yes, Ludwig van Beethoven, 1770 to 1827, suffered a gradual hearing loss during his 20s. And eventually lost his hearing altogether, in his early 30s. The loss was devastating to the German composer. In a letter to his brother he wrote, But how humbled I feel when someone near me hears the distant sound of a flute. And I hear nothing, when someone hears a shepherd singing, and I hear nothing. At one point he even contemplated suicide but instead continued his work. He had studied briefly with Mozart, in 1787, and Joseph Haydn, in 1792. And appeared for the first time in his own concert in 1800 while the loss of his hearing later prevented him from playing the piano properly, it did nothing to hold back his creativity. Between 1800 and 1824, Beethoven wrote nine symphonies, and many believe that he developed the form to perfection. His other works include five piano concertos and 32 piano sonatas, as well as string quartets. Sonatas for piano and violin, opera, and vocal music, including oratorios. It was about the time that he completed his work on his third symphony. The Eroica, 1804, that he went completely deaf. Though he was himself a classicist, music critics often refer to a turning point marked by the Eroica. Which shows the complexity of the Romantic Age of Music. A true genius, Beethoven's innovations include expanding the length of both the symphony and the piano concerto. Increasing the number of movements in the string quartet, from 4 to 7 and adding instruments including the trombone, contrabassoon, and the piccolo to the orchestra, giving it a broader range. Through his adventurous piano compositions, Beethoven also heightened the status of the instrument, which was a relatively new invention, 1710. Among his most well-known and most often performed works are his third, Eroica, 5th, 6th, pastoral, and 9th, choral, symphonies, as well as the 4th and 5th piano concertos. It is remarkable even unfathomable that these works, so familiar to so many, were never heard by their composer. A poignant anecdote tells of Beethoven sitting on stage to give tempo cues to the conductor during the first public performance of his Ninth Symphony. 
when the performance had ended, Beethoven his back to the audience was. Unaware of the standing ovation his work had received until a member of the choir. Turned Beethoven's chair around so he could see the tremendous response. How is Picasso's work characterized? It's impossible to characterize or classify the work of Spaniard Pablo Picasso, 1881-1973. Since his career as an artist spanned his entire life and he experimented with many disciplines. Picasso often claimed that he could draw before he could speak. And by all accounts he spent much of his childhood engaged in drawing. He was only 15 years old when he submitted his first works for exhibition. And by the turn of the century, when he was still a young man, he began exploring the blossoming modern art movement. The rest of his career breaks into several periods. His Blue Period, 1901-04, was named for the monochromatic use of the color for its subjects and was likely the result of a despair brought on by the suicide of a friend. Next came his Rose Period, beginning 1905, when images of harlequins and jesters appear in his works all to a somewhat melancholic effect. He soon began to incorporate aspects of primitive art, and later experimented with geometric line and form in his works, which were constructions or deconstruct ions sometimes only identifiable by their title. In the spring of 1912 Cubism exploded, and Picasso was on its forefront. In 1923 he broke new ground with surrealism. The key masterpiece in his body of works came in 1937 when he painted Guernica. His rendering of the horror of the German attack, supported by Spanish fascists, on the small Basque town, of Guernica, in Spain. His career reached its height during the 1940s, during which he lived in Nazi-occupied Paris. Biographer Pierre Cabane summed up the last period, 1944-73, of Picasso's work. He invented a second classicism. Autobiographical classicism. His final 30 years were to be a dizzying, breakneck race toward creation. During this time, Picasso did not chart any new artistic territory but simply created art at an amazing rate. After his death in 1973, his estate yielded an inventory of 35,000 remaining works paintings. Drawings, sculptures, ceramics, prints, and woodcuts. He left an enormous even mind-boggling legacy to the art world. In a 1991 article in Vanity Fair, Picasso's friend and biographer John Richardson observed. Almost every artist of any interest who's worked in the last 50 years is indebted to. Picasso, whether he's reacting against him knowingly or is unwittingly influenced by him. Picasso sowed the seeds whose fruits we are continuing to reap. Why is Brahms's first symphony sometimes called Beethoven's tenth?
In many ways, Johannes Brahms, 1833-1897, was the inheritor of Beethoven's genius. Prompting some music historians to refer to Brahms's first symphony as Beethoven's tenth. This is not to diminish the work of the great 19th century composer who left an enduring corpus of works. Brahms demonstrated that classicism continued to have artistic validity and was not incompatible with the romanticism of the late 19th century. How old was Mozart when he composed his first work? A child prodigy, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, 1756-1791, was composing at the age of five. He had been playing the harpsichord since the age of three. His father, Leopold, 1719-1787, was a composer and violinist who recognized his son's unusual music ability and encouraged and taught young Mozart. In 1762 Leopold took his son and daughter, Maria Anna, nicknamed Nannerl, 1751-1829, on tour to Paris. While there, young Wolfgang Mozart composed his first published violin sonatas and improvisations. However, the image of the effortless and artless child of nature is not altogether true. Contrary to the reports that the gifted composer never revised first and only drafts, he did work at his craft. In a letter to his father, he wrote, It is a mistake to think that the practice of my art has become easy to me no one has given so much care to the study of composition as I have. There is scarcely a famous master in music whose works I have not frequently and diligently studied. The fact is that he did make revisions to his works. Though it is also true that he composed at a rapid pace. The result is an impressive body of works, unequaled in beauty and diversity. The complete output some 600 works in every form, symphonies, sonatas, operas, operettas, cantatas, arias, duets, and others, would be enough to fill almost 200 CDs. Among his most cherished works are The Marriage of Figaro, 1786 Don Giovanni 1787 Cosi Fan Tutte 1790 and The Magic Flute 1791 When was the first kindergarten The world's first kindergarten opened in 1837 in Blankenburg, Germany. Under the direction of educator Friedrich Froebel, 1782-1852. Froebel went on to establish a training course for kindergarten teachers. And he introduced the schools throughout Germany. Such schools and classes for children ages 4 to 6 are the norm today in much of the world. When were the first schools established?
The first formal education began shortly after the development of writing, c. 3000 BC, when both the Sumerians, who had developed a cuneiform system of pictographics, and the Egyptians, who developed hieroglyphics, established schools to teach students to read and write the systems. After the development of the first alphabet, between 1800 and 1000 BC, by Semitic people in Syria, religious schools were set up. Priests taught privileged boys to read sacred Hebrew writings, the Torah. The first school that was open to everyone, not just the upper classes. May well have been that established by Chinese philosopher Confucius, 551 to 479 BC. Who taught literature and music, conduct, and ethics to anyone who wanted to learn. The Western model of education is based on the ancient Greek schools, which were founded about the 5th century BC in the city state of Sparta. Boys were not only trained for the military, they also learned reading and writing and studied music. In Athens, boys learned to read and write, memorized poetry, and learned music as well as trained in athletics. In the second half of the 5th century BC, the Sophists, ancient Greek teachers of rhetoric and philosophy, schooled young men in the social and political arts, hoping to mold them into ideal statesmen. What was the first university in the Western Hemisphere? It was the University of Santo Domingo, founded in 1538 by the Spaniards in the Dominican Republic, which occupies the eastern half of the Caribbean island of Hispaniola. When did higher education begin? About the 6th century B. C. Schools of medicine existed on the island of Kos, Greece. Where philosophers theorized on the nature of man and the universe. The Pythagoreans, followers of Greek philosopher and mathematician Pythagoras, c. 580-500 BC, began the first schools of higher education in southern Italy where philosophy and mathematics were taught in Greek. The great philosophers Socrates, Plato and Aristotle carried on the Pythagorean tradition as did Epicurus and Zeno in the 4th century BC universities have a long history in the Arab world, for example. The Al-Azhar University in Cairo was founded in about AD 970 and is one of the oldest universities in the world. Separation of church and state affected the public schools? Religion in American public schools continued to be a hot topic throughout the 1900s. But the Supreme Court rulings in the middle of the 20th century proved to have the most bearing on religious practices in state-supported schools. On June 17, 1963, in an 8-to-1 ruling, 
the Supreme Court decided that prayer and Bible reading in U.S. public schools were unconstitutional. The decision, in the case of Skemp v. Abington Township, culminated a series of high court rulings over the course of almost 20 years, which gradually removed the practice of religious activities from public schools. The rulings began in 1947 with the New Jersey case of Everson v. Board of Education, in which the court, in a 5 to 4 vote, defended the use of state funds to transport children to parochial schools, but warned that a wall of separation between church and state must be maintained. In 1948, in McCollum v. Board of Education, the court banned a program of religious instruction from the schools of Champaign, Illinois. In Engel v. Vital, 1962, the justices of the Supreme Court ruled that the state-composed prayer recited in New York classrooms was unconstitutional. What is no drama? It is the oldest form of traditional Japanese drama, dating to a d 1383. It is rooted in the principles of Zen Buddhism, a religion emphasizing meditation, discipline, and the transition of truth from master to disciple. History and legend are the subjects of no plays, which are traditionally performed on a bear. Wooden stage by masked male actors who performed the story using highly controlled movements. The drama is accompanied by a chorus, which chants lines from the play. The art form was pioneered by actor dramatist Moto Kiyozimi, 1363 1443, when he was 20 years old. Zimi had begun acting at age 7 and went on to write more than half of the roughly 250 no dramas that are still performed today. What was the Lyceum movement? It was a public education movement that began in the 1820s and is credited with promoting the establishment of public schools, libraries, and museums in the United States. The idea was conceived by Yale-educated teacher and lecturer Josiah Holbrook, 1788-1854. Who in 1826 set up the first American Lyceum in Millbury, Massachusetts? He named the program for the place a grove near the Temple of Apollo Lycers, where the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC, taught his students. The Lyceums, which were programs of regularly occurring lectures, Proved to be the right idea at the right time, they got underway just after the completion of the Erie Canal. 1825, which permitted the settlement of the nation's interior. Just as the notion that universal, free education was imperative to the preservation of American democracy took hold. The movement spread quickly. At first the lectures were homegrown affairs, featuring local speakers. But as the movement grew, lyceum bureaus were organized, which sent paid lecturers to speak to audiences around the country. 
the Lyceum speakers included such noted Americans as writers Ralph Waldo Emerson. 1803-1882, Henry David Thoreau, 1817-1862, and Nathaniel Hawthorne, 1804-1864. As well as activist Susan B. Anthony, 1820 to 1906. After the Civil War, 1861 to 65. The educational role of the Lyceum movement was taken over by the Protestant-led Chautauquas. What was the first American university? It was Harvard, chartered on October 28, 1636, by the Massachusetts General Court, which passed a legislative act to found a college. It was not until November of the following year however, that there was further action. It was then that the general court decreed that the college be built in Newtown, Massachusetts, which in 1638 was renamed Cambridge after England's Cambridge University, where some colonists had studied. In fall of that year, Harvard's first professor, Nathaniel Eaton, began classes at which time the first building was under construction and a library was being assembled. The university got its name not from a founder, but from a newly arrived British philanthropist and colonial clergyman, John Harvard, 1607-1638, who left the library some 400 volumes and donated about £800 sterling to the college. The institution was named in his honor in 1639, the year after he died. The first state university was the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. It was founded in 1789. And in 1795 it became the first public institution of higher education in the United States to begin enrolling students. What was Vaudeville? Light, comical theatrical entertainment. Vaudeville flourished at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. Programs combined a variety of music, theater, and comedy to appeal to a wide audience. Script writers attracted immigrant audiences by using ethnic humor, exaggerating dialects, and joking about the difficulties of daily immigrant life in America. The word vaudeville is derived from an old French term for a satirical song. Vaudeville, which is a reference to the Vire Valley of France, where the songs originated. Vaudeville made its way to the American stage by the 1870s. When acts performed in theaters in New York, Chicago, and other cities. Troops traveled a circuit of nearly 1,000 theaters around the country. As many as 2 million Americans a day flocked to the shows to see headliners such as comedians Eddie Cantor. 1892-1964, and W.C. Fields, 1880-1946. Singer Eva Tangway, 1878-1947, and French actress Sarah Bernhardt, 1844-1923. During the first two decades of the 20th century, 
Vaudeville was the most popular form of entertainment in the country. In the 1930s, just as New York opened the doors of its famous Radio City Music Hall, which was intended to be a theater for vaudeville, the entertainment form began a quick decline. Motion pictures, radio, and, later, television took its place. With numerous vaudeville performers parlaying their success into these new media. Among those entertainers who had their origins in vaudeville acts were actors Rudolph Valentino, Cary Grant, Mae West, Jack Benny, George Burns, Gracie Allen, Ginger Rogers, Fred Astaire, Will Rogers, and Al Jolson. How old is the concept of public schools? It dates at least as far back as ancient China. The philosopher Confucius, 551 to 479 BC, was among the first in China to advocate that primary school education should be available to all. He averred that in education there should be no class distinctions. He never refused a student, even though he came to me on foot. With nothing more to offer as tuition than a package of dried meat. Confucius asserted that any man including a peasant boy had the potential to be a man of principle. However, it was not until the Age of Enlightenment that public schools were widely instituted. In Prussia, present-day Germany, Frederick the Great, 1712 to 1786, was considered an enlightened ruler for, among other things, founding a public education system, which became established during the early 1800s. After Prussia united with Germany to form a powerful state, other European countries began instituting systems of public education which were credited by many as an important factor in Prussia's rise. By the early 20th century, public elementary schooling was both free and compulsory in most of Europe. Free secondary education was also offered in some nations. In the United States, public schools had their beginnings during colonial times. In 1647 Massachusetts passed a law requiring the establishment of public schools. Why do music historians talk about before Bach and after Bach? Some scholars use these terms to classify music history since the life work of Johann Sebastian Bach. 1685 to 1750 was so substantial, consisting of some 1100 works and has had lasting and profound influence on music composition. While he was not famous during his lifetime and had disagreements with employers throughout his career. J. S. Bach's works and innovations in many ways defined music as people now know it. The tempered scale is among his inventions, and he initiated a keyboard technique that is considered standard today. Chronologically. J. S. Bach marks the end of the prolific and variegated Baroque era, which began about 1600 and ended the year of his death, 1750. A devout Christian. J. S. Bach believed that all music was to the glory of God and the recreation of the human spirit. 
as a spiritual person and true believer in eternal life, he left behind an impressive body of church music. Including 300 cantatas, or musical sermons, as well as passions and oratorios. As a devoted family man who believed all his children were born musicians. And therefore, the backs could stage drawing room music at any time. J. S. Bach also wrote chamber music, including instrumental concertos, suites, and overtures. Among his most well known and beloved works are the St. Matthew Passion, Jesu, Joy of Man's Desiring, Sheep May Safely Graze, and his Christmas Oratorio. How many musical backs were there? Johann Sebastian Bach, 1685-1750 Was only one of a long and extended line of competent musicians some 14 of them. The Bach family was a musical dynasty. J.S.S. father, Ambrosius Bach, 1645-1695 Was a court musician for the Duke of Eisenach, and several of J.S. Bach's close relatives were organists in churches. His eldest brother, Johann Christoph Bach, 1671-1721, was apprenticed to the famous German composer Johann Patch Elbel. 1653-1706, J.S. Bach left a musical legacy even beyond the vast body of church. Vocal, and instrumental music that he composed, four of his sons and one grandson were. Also accomplished musicians. The English Bach refers to J.S.S. son Johann Christian Bach, 1735-1782. Who composed operas, oratorios, arias, cantatas, symphonies, concertos, and chamber music. A proponent of Rococo style music, J. C. Bach influenced Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, 1756-1791. What is a passion play? A passion play is a dramatization of the scenes connected with the passion and crucifixion of Jesus. Christ. The roots of the passion play can be traced to ancient times. Early Egyptians performed plays dedicated to the god Osiris, god of the underworld and judge of the dead. And the Greeks also acted out plays to honor their god Dionysus, the god of fertility, wine, and, later, drama. During the Middle Ages, 500-1350, liturgical, religious ceremonial, dramas were performed. Toward the end of the 10th century, the Western Church began to dramatize parts of the Latin Mass, especially for holidays such as Easter. These plays were performed in Latin by the clergy, inside the church building. Eventually the performances became more secular. With laymen acting out the parts on the steps of the church or even in marketplaces. The liturgical dramas developed into so-called miracle plays or mystery plays. As a symbol of gratitude or as a request for a favor. Villagers would stage the life story of the Virgin Mary or of a patron saint. When the plague, also called the Black Death, ravaged Europe, 
the villagers at Oberammergau. Germany, in the Bavarian Alps. Vowed to enact a passion play at regular intervals in the hope that by so doing they would be spared the Black Death. They first performed this folk drama in 1634 and have continued to stage it every ten years. Attracting numerous tourists to the small town in southern Germany. When was photography established as an art form? In the early 1900s. Alfred Stieglitz, 1864-1946, is the acknowledged father of modern photography. His interest in the medium began when he was just a toddler, at the age of two. He became obsessed with a photo of his cousin, carrying it with him at all times. When he was nine years old, he took exception to a professional photographer's practice of using pigment to color a black and white photo, complaining that this spoiled the quality of the print. Between 1887 and 1911 Stieglitz worked to establish photography as a valid form of artistic expression. A pursuit for which he was sometimes publicly derided. He believed that photography should be separate from painting, but on an equal footing as an art form. He also strove to differentiate photography by instilling it with an American essence. The streets of New York City became his subject. By the time Stieglitz founded the Photo Secession Group in 1902, he had developed a uniquely American art form. Stieglitz also published and edited photography magazines, most notably Camera Work, 1903-17. After an unhappy first marriage, in 1924, Stieglitz married American artist Georgia O'Keeffe. 1887-1986 who became the subject of one of his best-known series of works. So much art is called Impressionistic today. What exactly is Impressionism? The term Impressionism was derived by a rather mean-spirited art critic from the title of one of Claude Monet's 1840-1926, Early Paintings, Impression, Fog, La Havre, 1872. The French Impressionist painters were interested in the experience of the natural world and in rendering it exactly as it is seen not fixed and frozen with an absolute perspective, but rather as constantly changing and as it is glimpsed by a moving eye. George Isra, 1859-1891, and Paul Signac, 1863-1935, are also typically thought of as impressionists. However, they are more appropriately dubbed Neo-Impressionists since they along with Camille Picero, 1830-1903, advanced the work of the original group through more scientific theories of light and color, introducing deliberate optical effects to their works. Seurat and Signac are commonly referred to as Pointeists for the technique. Pioneered by Seurat, of using small brush strokes to create an intricate mosaic effect. The post-impressionists, 
artists representing a range of explorations but all having come out of the Impressionist movement. Included both Seurat and Signac, as well as Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec. 1864-1901 Paul Gauguin, 1848-1903, Vincent van Gogh, 1853-1890. And Paul Cezanne, 1839-1906, who was also associated with the original Impressionists. Together the Impressionists paved the way for the art of the 20th century. Since as a group they asserted the identity of a painting as a thing, a created object in its own right. With its own structure and its own laws beyond and different from, the world of man and nature, history of modern art. When was our system for notating music developed? The innovation came in the early 11th century, when Guido of Arezzo, c. 991-1050, an Italian monk, devised a precise system for defining pitch. Guido was a leading music teacher and theorist in his day. As such, he was invited in about 1028 to Rome where he presented a collection of religious anthems to Pope John XIX. Guido used a system of four horizontal lines, a staff, on which to chart pitch, and he used the syllables ut. Later replaced with do, re, mi, fa, sol, and la to name the first six tones of the major scale. Before Guido developed his precise method for teaching music, singers had to learn melodies by memorizing them, a process that took many years. Using his notating system, singers were able to sight read melodies. Guido's famous treatise, Micrologus, was one of the most widely used instruction books of the Middle Ages, 500-1350. How did Montessori schools get started? The schools, evident throughout the United States, as well as Great Britain, Italy, the Netherlands, Spain, Switzerland, Sweden, Austria, France, Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, Argentina, Japan, China, Korea, Syria, India, and Pakistan, carry the name of their founder, Maria Montessori. 1870-1952 She was the first woman in Italy to earn a medical degree and to practice medicine. In 1900 Montessori pioneered teaching methods to develop sensory, motor, and intellectual skills in retarded kindergarten and primary school students. Under her direction, these unteachable pupils not only mastered basic skills, including reading and writing, but they passed the same examinations given to all primary school students in Italy. Montessori then spent time in the country's primary schools, where she observed the educators' practice of teaching by rote, by using repetition and memory and their reliance on restraint, silence, and a system of reward and punishment in the classroom. She believed her system, 
called scientific pedagogy, which was based on non-coercive methods and self-correcting materials, such as blocks, graduated cylinders, scaled bells, and color spectrums, would yield better results in students. Montessori theorized that children possess a natural desire to learn and if put in a prepared environment, their spontaneous activity would prove educational. Instead of lecturing to their students, Montessori encouraged educators to simply demonstrate the correct use of materials to students who would then teach themselves and each other. She also believed in community involvement in schools. Encouraging parents and other community members to take active roles in the education of the children. When Montessori put these principles into action, it was to highly favorable results. In 1909 Montessori published the Montessori Method, which was made available in English three years later and became an instant bestseller in the United States. Her method, which she believed would develop and set free a child's personality in a marvelous and surprising way, caught on. For Montessori, who has been called a triumph of self-discipline, persistence, and courage, spreading the message about her teaching method became her life's work. She was still traveling, speaking to enthusiastic crowds the world over. When she died in the Netherlands at the age of 81, Montessori's beliefs which were both scientific and spiritual had a profound effect not only on students in Montessori schools, but on primary education in general. When was the first university established in the West? The first modern Western university was established in the Middle Ages 1158 to be exact in Bologna, Italy. It was in that year that Frederick I. C. 1123 to 1190, Holy Roman Emperor, asserted his authority in Lombardy. He granted the first university charter for the University of Bologna, authorizing its students to organize the universities that were set up in Europe during the Middle Ages. 1350 were not any necessarily places or groups of buildings, they were more often groups of scholars and students. The University of Paris, which today includes the renowned Sorbonne. The university's liberal arts and sciences division, soon became the largest and most famous university in Europe. The Sorbonne itself was founded in 1250 as a school of theology. It was reorganized in the 1600s by 1500 universities had been founded throughout the continent. Of these, the ones that survive today include the universities of Cambridge and Oxford in England. Those at Montpellier, Paris, and Toulouse, France, Heidelberg, Germany. Bologna, Florence, Naples, Padua, Rome, and Siena, Italy, and Salamanca, Spain. The methods and techniques developed in these early institutions set standards of academic inquiry that remain part of higher education in the world today.
Why is Rembrandt considered the archetype of the modern artist? To understand the similarities between Rembrandt van Rijn, 1606-1669, and the modern artist. It's important to note that this master portrait painter, who broke ground in his use of light and shadow, was in his own time criticized for his work, some thought it too personal or too eccentric. An Italian biographer asserted that Rembrandt's works were concerned with the ugly. And he described the artist as a tasteless painter. Rembrandt's subjects included lower class people, the events of everyday life and everyday business. As well as the humanity and humility of Christ, rather than the choirs, trumpets and celestial triumph that were the subjects of other religious paintings at the time. His portraits reveal his interest in the effects of time on human features including his own. In summary, the Dutch artist approached his work with psychological insight and profound sympathy for the human affliction. He was also known to use the butt end of his brush to apply paint. Thus, he strayed outside the accepted limits of great art at the time. Art critics today recognize Rembrandt as not only one of the great portrait painters, but a master of realism. The Dutch painter, who also etched, drew, and made prints, is regarded as an example for the working artist. He showed that the subject is less important than what the artist does with his materials. Among his most acclaimed works are the Syndics of the Cloth Guild, 1662, and The Return of the Prodigal Son. See 1665. The first painting shows a board of directors going over the books. And Rembrandt astutely captures the moment when the six businessmen are interrupted, thus showing a remarkably real everyday scene. The Return of the Prodigal Son is one of the most moving religious paintings of all time. Here Rembrandt has with great compassion rendered the reunion of father and son. Capturing that moment of mercy when the contrite son kneels before his forgiving father. Through his series of self-portraits, Rembrandt documented his own history from the confidence and optimism of his youth to the worn resignation of his declining years. Was Monet the father of French Impressionism? Though the movement was named for one of Claude Monet's 1840-1926 paintings and his water lilies. 1905 are arguably the most well-known and highly acclaimed Impressionist works. Impressionism is actually rooted in the works of the group's spiritual leader, Edouard Manet, 1832-1883, who first began experimenting with color and light to bring a more naturalistic quality to painting. In 1863 Manet exhibited two highly controversial and groundbreaking works, Déjeuner sur Elherbe and Olympia. Both paintings were based on classic subjects. But Manet rendered these pastoral scenes according to his own experience, giving them a decidedly more earthy and blatantly erotic quality than the Parisian critics and academicians of the day could accept. 
he was roundly criticized for his scandalous exhibition. Nevertheless, Manet persevered, and in 1868, with his portrait of the French writer Emile Zola. He again challenged the art world and its values. A critic for L.E. National denounced the portrait and cited among his complaints that Zola's trousers were not made of cloth. This, the artists observed, was both truth and revelation, the pants were made of paint. A few years later, in 1870, Manet began experimenting with painting outside. In the brilliance of natural sunlight, Manet pioneered many of the ideas and techniques taken up by the Impressionists. When were schools in the United States desegregated? On May 17, 1954, in the case of Brown v. Board of Education, the Supreme Court ruled, 9-0, that racial segregation in public schools is unconstitutional. The court overturned the separate but equal doctrine laid down in the 1896 case. Plessy v. Ferguson. Chief Justice Earl Warren, 1891-1974. Ordered the states to proceed with all deliberate speed to integrate educational facilities. Also in 1954, on November 7, the Supreme Court ordered desegregation of public golf courses. Parks, swimming pools, and playgrounds. In the aftermath of these rulings, desegregation proceeded slowly and painfully. In the early 1960s sit-ins, freedom rides, and similar expressions of nonviolent resistance by blacks and their sympathizers led to a decrease in segregation practices in public facilities. How has the U.S. Why is Titian thought of as the father of modern painting? During Titian's time, 1488 or 1490 to 1576, artists began painting on canvas rather than on wood panels. A master of color, the Venetian painter was both popular and prolific. His work was so sought after that even with the help of numerous assistants, he could not keep up with demand. His body of works established oil color on canvas as the typical medium of Western pictorial tradition. Among his most well-known paintings are Sacred and Profane Love, C. 1515, and Venus of Urbino, 1538. How old is comedy? Like tragedy, comedy as a form of drama dates back to ancient Greece. While tragedy was meant to engage human emotions, thereby cleansing spectators of their fears. According to Aristotle, Comedy's intent was simply to entertain and amuse audiences. Athenian poet Aristophanes, who flourished circa the 5th century BC, is considered the greatest ancient writer of comedy. 
his plays, written for the festival of Dionysus, the god of fertility, wine. And, later, drama, were a mix of social, political, and literary satire. Performance vehicles included farce, parody, and fantasy. During the 4th century BC, this old comedy evolved into a new comedy, which was less biting and more romantic and realistic in nature. New comedy, which was marked by strong character development and often subtle humor, includes the works of Greek playwright Menander, flourished during the 4th century BC, and those of Roman comic writers Plautus, flourished 3rd century BC, and Terence. Flourished 2nd century BC, all of whom were influences on Ben Jonson. William Shakespeare, Jean Moliere, and other writers of the 16th and 17th centuries. How did American Mary Cassatt join the Paris art world of the Impressionists? Mary Cassatt, 1844-1926, the daughter of a wealthy investment banker from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, traveled to Paris in 1866 in the company of her mother and some women friends. The young Cassatt was determined to join the city's community of artists. Since women were not allowed to enroll in classes at Paris's Institute of Beaux-Arts, the policy was changed in 1897, Cassatt privately studied painting and traveled in Europe, pursuing her artistic interests. Returning to Paris in 1874, she became acquainted with Edgar Degas, 1834-1917, who remarked that the American artist possessed an infinite talent and that she was a person who feels as I do. He made these observations after viewing one of her paintings at the Salon d'Automne in Paris. Cassatt went on to exhibit with the Impressionists in 1879, 1880, 1881, and 1886, gaining her first solo exhibit in 1891. Judith Barter Curator of American Arts at the Art Institute of Chicago and organizer of The Traveling Exhibit Mary Cassatt, Modern Woman describes Cassatt as a very good businesswoman, who knew how to market her career. During three and a half years of research, which she conducted to launch the exhibit, Barter explored the prevailing social climate of the day, the late 19th century was a time when feminists who organized to campaign for political and social reforms, eventually winning women the vote in 1920. Focused on maternity, encouraging women to be involved in caring for their children. To Cassatt, observed Barter, maternity was the highest expression of womanhood. Women and children were the subjects of Cassatt's body of works. Which includes oil paintings, pastels, prints, and etchings. Cassatt's place among the Impressionists has often been overshadowed by her male colleagues. And her contributions to the art world are mentioned only in passing in many art books. But her talent, insights, and sheer determination combine to create an impressive legacy. As Gauguin quipped, Mary Cassatt has charm but she also has force. When was photography invented?
The concept of still photography dates back to the 10th century when Islamic scientists developed the camera obscura. Latin for dark chamber, a darkened enclosure with a small aperture, opening, to admit light. The light rays would cast an inverted image of external objects onto a flat surface opposite the aperture. This image could be studied and traced by someone working inside the camera obscura. Or the image could be viewed from the outside of the camera, through a peephole. In the 16th century, the Italian scientist Giambattista della Porta, c. 1535-1615, published his studies on fitting the aperture of the camera. Obscura with a lens to strengthen or enlarge the image projected. Made increasingly versatile through additional improvements. The camera obscura become popular among 17th and 18th century European artists. But the camera obscura could only project, rather than reproduce, images onto a screen or a piece of paper. During the 1800s scientists experimented with ways of making the images permanent. Among those who made advances in the photographic process were French physicist Joseph Nicephorne Yeps. 1765-1833, who produced the first negative image in 1826, French painter Louis Jacques Daguerre. 1759 to 1851, who in 1839 succeeded in making a direct positive image on a silver plate. Known as the daguerreotype, English scientist William Henry Fox Talbot, 1800 to 1877, who developed a paper negative, c. 1841, that could be used to print any number of paper positives and English astronomer Sir John Herschel. 1792 to 1891, who was the first to produce a practical photographic fixing. Agent and the first to apply the terms positive and negative to photographic images. All of these milestones made photography a practical way of permanently recording real life images. The breakthrough in still photography was the Kodak. Introduced in 1888 by American inventor George Eastman, 1854 to 1932. The Kodak camera used film that was wound on rollers. Eliminating the glass photographic plates that had been in use. The box-shaped camera made photography accessible to everyone including amateurs. By the early 1900s the Eastman Kodak company had become the largest photographic film and camera producer in the world. George Eastman has been credited with mass-producing the moment, before the Kodak. A word he made up because he was fond of the letter K, photography had largely been the domain of professionals who were commissioned to take portraits of the well-to-do prominent members of society. Once the Kodak became widely available, photographs preserved the faces of ordinary people and the events of everyday life. What does Wagnerian mean? It is a reference to anything that is in the style of German composer Richard Wagner, 1813-1883. Wagner was an enormously creative composer, conductor an artistic manager who is credited with no less than originating the music drama. 
His interest in theatre began in his boyhood, and by his teens he was writing plays. So that he could put music to these works, he sought out composition teachers. It is no surprise then that Wagner later conceived of the idea of the total work of art. Where music, poetry, and the visual arts are brought together in one stunning performance piece. As an adult, Wagner led a scandalous life even today challenging. The music listening public to separate his life from his art. He was someone modern audiences would recognize as a truly gifted and charismatic if immoral artist, working on a grand scale. Were he alive now, Wagner might well be creating blockbusters. In fact his musical compositions are heard in movies, including Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now. And are familiar to even the youngest audience today or at least those who watch Bugs Bunny cartoons. But this is not to take away from Wagner's serious accomplishments. His most widely recognized operatic works include Lohengrin, 1848, The Ring Cycle, 1848 to 74, and Tristan Uendi is sold, 1859. In the decades after his death, Wagner's reputation grew to the point that through the end of the 19th century his influence was felt by most every composer who often referred to Wagner's works in measuring the value of their own. What does Wagnerian mean? It is a reference to anything that is in the style of German composer Richard Wagner, 1813-1883. Wagner was an enormously creative composer, conductor, an artistic manager who is credited with no less than originating the music drama. His interest in theatre began in his boyhood, and by his teens he was writing plays. So that he could put music to these works, he sought out composition teachers. It is no surprise then that Wagner later conceived of the idea of the total work of art where music, poetry, and the visual arts are brought together in one stunning performance piece. As an adult, Wagner led a scandalous life even today challenging. The music listening public to separate his life from his art. He was someone modern audiences would recognize as a truly gifted and charismatic if immoral artist, working on a grand scale. Were he alive now, Wagner might well be creating blockbusters. In fact his musical compositions are heard in movies, including Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now. And are familiar to even the youngest audience today or at least those who watch Bugs Bunny cartoons. But this is not to take away from Wagner's serious accomplishments. His most widely recognized operatic works include Lohengrin, 1848, The Ring Cycle, 1848 to 74, and Tristan Uendi is sold, 1859. In the decades after his death, Wagner's reputation grew to the point that through the end of the 19th century his influence was felt by most every composer who often referred to Wagner's works in measuring the value of their own. <laughs>